welcome everybody. This is Dr. David Miller here uh, coming to you live from the Cleveland Eye and Laser Surgery Center in Cleveland, Ohio. We have uh, done several presentations with CyberSight and uh, I've been fortunate enough to be invited back and talk to you today about the fundamentals of macular surgery. So I want to uh, thank you all for uh, joining us this morning and making this program so wildly successful. We're going to cover um, principles of macular surgery and hopefully get through two live surgeries for you. One a macular pseudo hole, one an epiretinal membrane related to a retinal detachment and silicon oil. So kind of more complex, but we'll see how the cases go and whether we get both in or not. So to start out this morning, um, I have a lecture, a small PowerPoint presentation that I'm gonna go through while they're prepping the patient behind me here. So, um, and I'll stop the block whenever you guys are ready, probably. So we're gonna do the block first. I'll just point the camera over this way a little bit and we'll get that done. Little retro ball bar, tension of some burn. This is five cc's of, five cc's of marcaine and lidocaine. Mixed one to one. And we saw the globe come up and the lid come down. So I think we have a pretty adequate block. Jennifer, you did great there. All right, we'll get you, get you going. So fundamentals of macular surgery. I work with a group here in town called Retina Associates of Cleveland. And we have a 15 surgeon group uh, that kind of centers around Northeast Ohio here in the United States. And... This is our location where we're coming live to you from. This is a five OR facility that does just eye surgery in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, last year we did about 3000 retinal surgeries here. So considerations, what we're trying to show you here today is techniques and surgery that can be repeatable, safe, effective, cover tissue stains, the principles of surgery, including relieving the vitreous traction, peeling the cortical vitreous, taking away epiretinal tissue, um, peeling the internal limbing membrane when, and when that's needed, when that's reasonable. Different techniques to do these things, including pinch and peel with forceps, picks to start an edge in forceps, the protractor, the system peeling, and also things like the flex loop for those who like a, a more uh, specific device to create a membrane peel. So I want to cover a little bit about the risk of vitrectomy in general. It's always worth recovering or covering again. Infection and endophthalmitis is always a concern. Retinal tear, retinal detachment, choroidal effusion, and hemorrhage, cataract, glaucoma, eye pressure problems post-op with uh, gas in the eye, and, and anesthesia block related. For macular surgery safety, you always want to have a nice pre-op evaluation. I think with macular work, um, optical coherence tomography, OCT, is uh, very helpful. I wouldn't say it's essential. I was around before OCT was being used, and we did macular work just then fine, but this gives us a better idea of our, of our considerations where surgery is indicated and what things are healing like postoperatively. So if, ideally, if you can do this type of work with the OCT in your clinic, um, it can be very adv advantageous. On the flip side is I don't think you need OCT on the microscope at all. I know there's technology out there like that. I have used it. I have not found it advantageous or needed in well over, I would say 99% of cases. So when it comes to macular surgery, OCT in the microscope, well, while it can be nice, isn't something you have to have. Um, adequate anesthesia is always helpful, keeps the eye from moving, keeps the patient comfortable. Sterile prep and technique, which my assistants are doing behind me today, where you we have with us again, Jenny's on the block with us here. She's my PA. And I thought maybe we're gonna turn the page, who's my other PA, but uh, Paige will not be uh, assisting on this one. Um, a good surgical assistant like Jenny is extremely helpful in making you comfortable trying to work with the same people. Proper scrotomy and wound placement is also critical for any vitrectomy. The pre-op evaluation, you always wanna greet the patient and pre-op check the surgical notes, make sure you got the eye marked, all those safety procedures, make sure you everyone's agreeing to what's being done, which eye, et cetera. Um, 
during the case, you always want to have great visualization. It's very hard to do macular work without seeing the macula clearly and sharply. You want to avoid all the retina trauma that could happen with picks, forceps, or scrapers. You want to make sure you got the proper vitreous substitute during the case. Balanced salt solutions, all we use here with no additives. Um, at the end of the case, there's air fill, gases, oils, or just the BSS. Tight wound closure, I'm going to emphasize again, we're doing sutureless vitrectomy, the vast majority of our cases. And if the wound's not well closed, certainly there's a higher risk of post-op hypotony or even worse, post-op infection. And of course, post-op evaluations and instructions should be included with every surgery. Um, the standard techniques here uh, for macular surgery would be a vitrectomy, creation of a vitreous separation, removal of the cortical vitreous, I think is always uh, prudent in any type of vitrectomy, removal of epiretinal membranes, possible removal of the internal limiting membrane, uh, gas fluid exchange if needed, face down positioning and macular hole surgeries in particular. I did want to cover a little bit about stains, dyes, and chromovitrectomy. A chromovitrectomy is a term where we use vital dyes or crystals to help improve the visualization during the surgery. I'm going to use some of these techniques today. In particular, we use IC green most of the time. I'm also going to try and demonstrate the use of uh, triamcinolone acetonide crystals. Um, you could also use triphene, triphene blue, brilliant blue, infracinine green, uh, other tissue stains to help you uh, guide your dissection in your peels. This shows um, a couple quick slides of the advantage of staining the internal limiting membrane in these sequence of pictures. You can see the membrane being peeled. Um, triamcinolone, the crystals are very helpful on the macular surface to show you that the cortical vitreous has been removed. I find the crystals more useful in peeling the hyloid than actual peeling epiretinal tissue, but it can be used to peel epiretinal tissue too if that's what's available to you. I see green that we're using here has a high affinity for the internal limiting membrane. Um, we use a pre-packaged product that was given systemically for endocyanin green angiography. Uh, it's been gaining popularity ever since the 1990s. The internal limiting membrane in particular is a difficult membrane when you're starting out the peel without staining. I, I would think even today at my experience level, it would still be difficult to peel the ILM without ICG, screen, uh, ICG staining. It's 2.5 microns thick. It's, I've heard the smallest structure or thinnest structure removed surgically anywhere in the body. So to do it when it's clear and not really visible is um, a whole nother level of talent that uh, uh, I think you're much safer and it's more effective if you can stain it to stain it. And there's the IC green that we use. And a couple of issues about IC green in particular, there is a risk, risk of toxicity. Um, it's a direct chemical toxic effect to the RPE cells. It can be potentiated with light exposure. So I always wanna be careful about how much time we're in the eye with the light pipe if we're using IC green dye. We also wanna keep the IC green dye off the RPE. So the retinal surface is fine, but you don't wanna put it subretinal or into the base of a macular hole. And I'll demonstrate that when I'm putting it in. Blue stains can be also used and approved for epiretinal tissue peeling and uh, ILM peeling also, but they do stain differently with different properties. Just an example of some of those there. And um, you always want to use the lower the concentration, the better, less light exposure, the better, wet versus dry methods. Um, be careful on dry method staining if you're drying the eye out first internally by doing an air fluid exchange and putting the dye directly on the macula, though you may get a better stain, you're also exposing the retina to more possible um, toxicity. So the benefits are improved surgical results, decreased operative time, lower reoperate, um, but the only downside is really toxicity concerns. So be careful with chromovitrectomy. So what we're gonna do here is start our surgery shortly. We're gonna confirm intraocular placement of the infusion, maintain intraocular spatial orientation, control the pressure, avoid trauma, check wound in in integrity, and of course, post-op instructions. At the end of the case, it's always nice to talk with the patient and go over some of those instructions. Um, our first case is um, a 61-year-old woman 
with uh, blurry vision in the right eye for six months. Vision's only 2030. So again, you got pretty good visual acuity. You want to be careful in these cases. Why are we doing the surgery? Macular surgery, for the most part, is elective, right? So you want to pick and choose your battles here uh, up to your confidence level. And in her case, she has diabetic macular edema that we've been struggling with for quite a long time, several years, using many, many ILEA injections. And she's ended up with an epiretinal membrane and a lamellar macular hole. So not a true thick thickness hole, but lamellar. And the part that's confusing us is uh, whether we should continue treating with these ILEA injections. When, when is this edema? When is this vitreo macular traction? So what we're gonna do is go in here and peel this macular surface off the retina. We're gonna try and collapse this lamellar hole that's being stretched apart with probably just an air bubble. We probably don't need um, long-term gas for her. So with that being said, we'll start the case now and I'll talk my way through it with you. Thank you. A couple of things in the prep and drape here. Notice how the lashes are caught behind the drape. I like to use a solid lid speculum. Also helps pull back any stray lashes. I don't like lashes on the field if at all possible. We do not cut them. I like to keep the cornea, cornea wet. We'll use a Q-tip or forceps to um, displace the con slightly. I don't always measure, but uh, I will today at the um, you know three, three and a half mark. And we'll look to put an incision right there. I like to make these wounds kind of long and straight going through the conge. You can see that the, um, and I like to make them near the horizontal, okay displace the conge again but again i like the wounds to be kind of long and straight and the cannula is kind of pointed towards me and the reason we do that is for wound closure at the end of the case it's kind of nice to have it set up that the cannulas are oriented towards me i know the wound is long and straight a nice long scleral tunnel is easier to collapse at the end of the case we are using a 25 gauge uh, dork system. And so I put all the cannulas in first because the eye is nicely pressurized. We already have the infusion on, but I already also know that it's in the eye. I can see the tip. And we tape in the infusion cannula. How you doing, Jennifer? Are you okay? Okay, don't talk now because it makes your head move a little bit. Okay, if you're having pain or have to cough or sneeze, let us know. Otherwise, just kind of enjoy the show and me talking, okay? All righty, thank you. So we're gonna got the light pipe in the eye and the vitrector, and here goes the, uh, we're using an eyeboss wide field visualizing system. Nice to work through a wide field device. We're gonna get that focused real well, get ourselves comfortable. And we are well focused. No, we're not. We're just going to take out this uh, wrinkle on the back. Yeah, we're just the retina work. So here we're starting our vitrectomy. Great, thank you. And so we want to do a nice, safe vitrectomy. We're going to core out the vitreous here and then look to create a vitreous separation or confirm that. Um, I will demonstrate using Kenalog at that point of the case or the triamcinolone acetonide crystals to show you how that does stain the, uh, not that it doesn't stain, but it helps you visualize the vitreous. So let's take that now to give everyone an idea of what that looks like. Jenny's helping us here and we're gonna, put, we're fine, we're fine. Unless this cannula is long. There we go. So we're just gonna come down here and put in a, you know, not even a, Tenth of a cc. Go ahead. A little bit more. Just think of go poof. There we go. Again, there we go. So you can see how it's kind of being held together there, indicating some vitreous likely is in, in the neighborhood. We're going to take a look here and you'll see how it reacts. You can see how it's kind of tugging. And the kennel log comes out pretty easily. You want to be uh, one comment about using. I'm calling it Kenalog, it's the trade name. Triamcinolone or triessence is a approved uh, compound that you could be using that at one point was in shortage. I'm, which, which one are we using, Jenny, do you know? 
it's Kenalog. So the triessence is still being a little difficult to get. But as you come down here, can you focus this for us? You can see how it's pulling down there. So the vitreous is still down here at the nerve. So we'll turn the cutter off, turn up the vacuum, and we're going to engage the cortical vitreous here. And what's nice is you can see the shadow out there. Watch the shadow right here as we pull up. I often don't use uh, um, triamcinolone. Sure thing. And so we just stretch it different directions. You can see it popping up. Oh, very nicely. And here goes the vitreous out temporally too. And so, and so we got the, sometimes the, I get questions about the settings on the machine, Jenny. What, what are we using today? Um, I put you up to 450 for the, to pop the hyloid and then back to 350. For yeah, okay. So we're aspirating at 350 with the cut right here on the Dork machine. And um, we put it, did run it up to 450 to, on the vacuum that popped the posterior hyloid up there. But you can see how nicely that came up. And now we're just gonna trim around here. I'll tend to use, always start temporally with my, whichever hands temporally, but if you're really right-handed dominant, um, I certainly have partners and know many colleagues who just always use the one hand, even in uh, doing retractomy. It's a little easier for some maneuvers if you can use the left hand on occasion. We're gonna switch hands here and take away a little more vitreous. And that alone, in this particular case with her type of traction, what we already have done, could actually be pretty curative. But since we do have this lamellar hole, um, which is not really affecting the vision too much, the lamellar hole is probably not affecting the vision too much, but it does in, impact how we treat the patient with the ILEA injections. You can see the diabetic hemorrhages in the periphery. Yeah. Another consideration here is to uh, add a little laser at the end of the case. Um, even though she's not proliferative diabetic retinopathy, a lot of times post vitrectomy, a little hard to judge how patients will progress in their retinopathy. It doesn't hurt to add a little PRP. So I think we'll do that for her, Jenny. Okay. We're gonna want to endo laser here at the end of the case. Now we're gonna move on to the uh, staining piece of this. We're gonna use IC green dye. Yeah, don't, yep, your cataract looks pretty good there. Yeah, we're gonna have to lay real quiet. That's the most important part of the peeling, okay? So yeah. we're gonna get. We don't want you to talk because it makes your head move, okay? So here we go. We're gonna get the IC green. Now watch, before she squirts, I'm just gonna talk a little bit here. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jenny, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, there you go. Now that's enough there. Now look how I, when I put this in, I'll definitely avoid the center of the macula. You know, one more right there. I avoid the center of the macula just in case there was a macular hole here or, or some of the dye inadvertently goes subretinal through a really hard push. We don't want that dye being under the center of the macula. So I put it under, under wet technique, meaning we don't drain the eye out. I find that to be quite adequate, saves a step. Also, I don't like the idea of putting the IC green dye or anything directly on the macula under air. I just don't like that idea of something that concentrated being in touch with the most sensitive part of the retina. You can see how the dye does stain the vitreous a little bit. So if you don't use triamcinolone here and the vitreous was still down, you would oftentimes see the IC green dye standing around the optic nerve too in the vitreous. A little bit more of a squirt there, it didn't quite go over. There you go. Mm, just a short term one. Yep, she's asking about the gas bubble, the patient is. And we're going to probably give her air. It'll be gone in a few days. So it would be pretty short acting. All right, now we're going to do our macular work, which is what we all came for. So. Yeah, there you go. A little bit of light, huh? And we'll try and keep the image pretty nice. I meant to ask um, Rachel. Yeah, let me show my normal technique, which is the pick. 
I'm going to show you how I do most of my cases, and there's a reason for this. I'm going to show you the right. You got it. So we're going to okay. so we're going to start with the pick here. And I meant to ask uh, anyone watching the video if we're okay. If you need more zooming or something, let me know. I could have. Okay, so you can see here the green stain. ILM stains really green. What's not staining, where it's missing like here and here and here, these parts where it's not stained, that's the epiretinal membrane. So IC green will stain ILM, but not ERM. If the ERM is really broad and diffuse, you get no staining at all. So I like to use this little pick to start an edge. And you can see we got one there. Now I don't put the pick, look how I kind of use the pick sideways almost, right? I like to use it sideways, not, not point down, but almost brushing with the broad side of the pick. You don't need the pick to be sharp. You just need some type of surface to engage that little ILM. Okay, and then what I'll typically do is use, sure, we'll show them the loop force up too. Let's do that now, might as well. This is a device I do not use really ever, but I'm gonna try and show it to you. So I will not claim to be the expert with this device. It's called a loop scraper and you can see how it retracts. And um, uh, yeah, I will, okay. So this loop scraper retracts in and out like this and we can push it out so it's very flexible and we can brush against the retinal surface to create an edge and it's just starting there And you can see how you can create an edge that way too. So now we got two edges that we started, right? One's right here and one's over here. Okay, so, and you can use this loop scraper if you wanted to going all the way around and just scrape, scrape, scrape your way around, trying to avoid any direct trauma to the central macula, of course. We're not gonna demonstrate that. I'm gonna go with my forcep here, which is a, 25 gauge reusable forcep. Now, a lot of forceps are disposable and that can be a bit of a cost issue. So depending where you're working at or your cost sensitivity, reusable can be a nice option if you can preserve the tips and not have a lot of damages. So we just grasp these started edges, right? And we peel out. And you can kind of see the ERM coming up first. So the ERM will kind of come off first. The rolling of that is a good sign you got some of the ILM too. Let me focus back down. And of course, you can always go to your other pinch, pinch point or start point, which was down here, and do something similar. I don't worry about trying to keep it as one piece, and I tend to knock the pieces off in the eye with the light pipe and then come back later and get all those out. So now we got a peeled spot here, doesn't stain quite as well because the RM was blocking some of our stain. This is more of a jigsaw piece, a jigsaw puzzle piece missing here, which is kind of nice. It's easier to see the edge. You can go down and pinch that edge and grab it. And notice how I'm peeling away from the central macula. I try to stay around the outside the centerpiece will come up. Now you can see an even larger piece missing, right? It goes all the way from here to here, kind of a um, kidney-shaped piece. I'm just trying to get a little better focus for you and for myself. I'm going to do the same thing again and try and grab that edge. Well, let me show you another technique. I just thought of something else. Oh, sure. Uh, Jenny just handed me the reusable, the disposable forceps to show the difference. Um, 
These forceps are disposable. And the nice thing about disposable forceps is you can just do pinch and peel more, more adequately. So you can just go down and start a new spot. The edges are sharp on these forceps because they're not reused. You can just go down and grab the retina usually and start your own new spot. You can see that right there. See how that works? You just go around with these. So instead of having to use the pick, right? Now, the downside is these are disposable and you throw them away, whereas the pick and the forcep I was using initially are reusable, you know, been used hundreds of times. So this forcep, very nice forcep. And this one's from this vortex or is this? Yeah, this is the vortex instrument. Um, you can see how nice that will just go around without having to use that, that pick at all. I'm gonna show you another way to peel, which is with the protractor. Now this is a little bit probably less common, but these protractors are such fine instruments nowadays that you can actually peel the internal limbing membrane with a protractor quite often. And sometimes it can be really handy because the protractor has a broader bite spot than the forceps. So if the membrane's shredding a lot, I'll just take this piece out first. You see the other ones flying around. I'll tell you what we can do is stain again first to make sure everyone can see what's gonna happen here. So a lot of times I'll restain. I try not to stain more than two times. Ideally, you know, you get one stain and you're done just because it avoids toxicity issues, putting more stuff in the eye. So we'll just do a little puff here and here and here and here and gentle. <laughs> That's gentle. That's very gentle. Got it. Very gentle. And as we're pulling out the dye, right, you can see where it's at and where it's not at because we restain that internal limiting membrane, that is. And what I found is that if I go down real close to the retina and hit the aspirator, I can quite oftentimes engage internal limiting membrane, just like this. And so that peels the central macula pretty well. You see all the green is gone now, the membrane around the center. And I'm gonna show you a little bit more of this technique. I'm gonna peel this nasal piece of the ERM. So you just come down and hit the floor of the protractor, rub up on these edges. You can see how that will just does such a nice job of peeling up almost just under tension of the suction. The trick is engaging the edge. And I would definitely caution that if you're starting that technique, you know, to be away from the central macula. If you do engage the retina, you want to know where your reflux is, you know? So I'm not going to engage the retina here purposely, but I will show you the reflux piece. I find that very helpful. So I stop, if I engage the retina right there, I would kick it over. You know, the machine go click and it spits it out. So if you do engage retina, don't pull away. You're gonna triple your trauma, right? But if you hit the reflex button like this, it just shoots it out. Then you can pull away. And so we'll show you this again, just because we're having so much fun, Jenny. And that's about it. So let's take a look at our macula here. We have a big peel of this ERM that was causing vitreo macular traction in a diabetic case, getting lots of ILEA injections. You can see the pseudo hole. When I peeled over the pseudo hole, in fact, when I peeled over the pseudo hole, in fact, you saw the hole kind of jump up and almost looked like a volcano a little bit, you know, close to being a full macular hole, but not quite. And this is going to put her a long way towards probably getting better treatment for the diabetic macular edema off the 
ILEA injections, right? I'm gonna put the PRP in, and then we're gonna look around with the depressor. So we're gonna put some light PRP in. Again, she's a moderate diabetic patient, moderate on the angiograms that were done pre-op, which I didn't bring photos up for you. But, and so, you know, you could certainly argue to skip this and keep her on injections and so on. I think that's just a tremendous burden for the patient to be injected for diabetic retinopathy. And of course I need the laser pedal by my left foot. So I'll wait for the uh, circulator or someone to get that for me. Thank you. And uh, I've learned <laughs> through experience not to reach out with my foot and fall off my chair. Yeah, make Jenny catch me. It's happened before. And um, so now I ask for help to get the pedal in the right place. So we don't need to put heavy burns in here. These can be fairly light gray burns. You know, that's my preference. Anyhow, in PRP, I know in the old days, you'd see eyes that looked like a bomb went off inside. The PRP was so heavy and intense. And, you, you know, we're just going to put scatter some light PRP around here. Doesn't have to be real symmetrical. You're just trying to get some peripheral laser in. What this does in the eye, obviously, is it treats areas of retinal ischemia, which lowers the amount of VEGF being created in the eye. Vascular endothelial growth factor, levels drop. Then I need less of the ILEA injections, which are anti-vascular growth factors. So I'm trying to get away from using pharmaceuticals to control the problem and using treatment like this, where the patient won't have to, no patient wants to you know, get injections indefinitely. Certainly those injections are extremely helpful. Um, been really landmark and groundbreaking paradigm shift in treatment with better outcomes than we've ever achieved, but it doesn't mean we abandon all the old techniques. There's still, still plenty of room for those. And I don't worry about whether I hit the bleeding spots or not. Again, I'm really trying to just get rid of retinal ischemia, which typically is in the far periphery and the temporal periphery, especially for macular edema. Don't ignore the temporal periphery. So we're going to switch hands here to get to that. You may have noticed too, there's a little bit of bleeding in the macula from some of the spots where I started the peels or where I was brushing with a pick or, or the loop or pinching with the forcep. We switch hands here. We use an extendable laser, by the way. You can see how that's a nice curve on there. And I'm going to, um, we can focus that a little bit. And I do care a little bit more about the laser and the temporal macula and the temporal periphery. It seems like that's a hot spot for retinal ischemia on all the angiograms and without running it. And I think this is a major contributor to her diabetic retinopathy and DME. Also remember her, her retinopathy here is somewhat blunted by the years of ILEA of injection. So you know, if we withdraw the injection, she may, you know, pop into a more rapid proliferative space. You always want to be careful about withdrawing those injections if you don't have a laser in the eye to be watching out for neovascularization. We can go pretty far out. These systems nowadays with wide field viewing, um, you know, we're getting well into the periphery here. And we're almost done. Again, not, not too heavy. doesn't have to be contiguous, certainly, what I would consider to be light or moderate amount of PRP in the periphery is more than fine. So here we are. So now we're looking at the uh, back of the eye. You can see the staining peel area, laser in the standby. And um, we retract the probe, withdraw the laser. Take a look now with our scleral depressor. She dropped the pressure in the eye, the infusion a little bit, so I can depress a little easier. Again, never a bad idea to check the peripheral retina um, under scleral depression at the conclusion of the case, like to avoid post-op retinal tearing and detachment. And in this particular case, uh, I, you know, certainly when you peel the, the vitreous, that's, those are the cases where you're going to tear the retina iatrogenically. So always a good idea to 
get a good look when you're pulling up the posterior hyaloid. Very good. So we had a nice uh, case there. Now let's go to, again, another very important part of the case. And that's pulling out the cannulas and making sure we don't have wound leaks. Can I have the other forcep too? I'll start with that. The lights on. So I'm going to pull this nasal cannula first. I'm going to pull it out the way I put it in, you know, which is this way. Now remember that we have a tunnel here that's kind of like this. You can see that hole. I'm going to take my forcep, my more pointed ones, and press it right over the roof of that tunnel. You know, and why do I do that? It helps collapse the wound. Okay. Jenny will check. Jenny will check with a Q-tip over there for me, and we'll see that it's not leaking. This one, same thing. Look for where the wound is at. We see it right there. Learned that from Dr. Goduni. She said, spread the forceps, find the hole. This is a Dr. Rao technique to collapse the tunnel, one of my partners. I'm always learning from, frankly, very good surgeons bringing me new ideas that make a lot of sense. I love this collapsing the tunnel technique in particular. Um, Jenny's gonna dry that for us and again, show us that there's no leak. I, uh, now we're gonna pull this last one. And again, we'll take a look at where the wound's at. It's right there. They look how the conge is displaced so that the wounds don't line up. That's always nice. I'm gonna collapse that tunnel. You can press pretty hard. I would not be afraid to press hard over these tunnels to the point where it makes almost a black mark. And of course, we'll check the pressure with my trusty finger and it says about 15. And we are set. Very good. So Jennifer, we're all done here. We're gonna get you out in a moment. We did not put air or gas in because I did not feel we had a true macular hole. So sometimes we leave you with air or gas. We did not, in your case, the way it peeled up, I feel quite confident we can watch that post-op and you'll be just fine with all the traction off. So uh, the next case is a little more um, involved. We have an eye with multiple surgeries from an outside surgeon. It was referred in from the outside. They had Three retinal, three retinal detachment surgeries, oils in the eye, the oil needs to come out and there's a big uh, membrane across the macula. So we're gonna try and peel that. So I'll go through a few of the uh, question and answers here. Um, what is the uh, fate of the vitreous substitutes? Um, I think what they're asking is what happens to the ones we put in the eye? So in this case, it's balanced salt solution in the end of the case. The eye will recirculate that on its own and that flu will probably be replaced by aqueous within three or four days. So uh, whether it's gas, gas can be resorbed relatively uh, quickly. If it's air, oil stays in there until removed. Um, gas bubbles, SF6, C3F8, different lengths of different solutions will last different lengths of time. Uh, the next question, any tips for separating the posterior hyaloid from the retinal surface in cases of breakthrough hemorrhage without iatrogenic breaks in areas with dotted pre-retinal hemorrhages. So yeah, in general, you wanna get the posterior hyaloid off, whether there's hemorrhages or not. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I think in a diabetic case with neovascularization at the disc, you're probably looking at a more difficult case. Uh, I think a vast and preoperatively will help a lot with that bleeding. You still wanna pop that off, let it bleed, raise the bottle, I tend to use bottle pressure a lot for um, uh, controlling intraocular bleeding. I don't hesitate at all to run the pressure up to 60, 70, even 100 millimeters of mercury. Uh, I know the optic nerve may flash in those points. A lot of times the blood pressure of the patient's pretty high too, but I tend to use a lot of intraocular tamponade just with uh, BSS. Not indefinitely, but a few minutes can go a long, long way. Um, Next, during intrasurgery, how do you control vitreous hemorrhage? Again, I do think the bottle pressure is your best friend there. And you're, even your better friend is preoperatively 
treating for that in diabetics or neovascular cases with uh, uh, intraocular, intravitreal um, avastin injections or your favorite anti-VEGF, whatever, whatever you have access to. We should peel the membrane from which direction? In general, peeling epiretinal tissue, severe macular pucker, you're always better off peeling from the optic nerve towards the periphery. And the reason that is, is the retina is thickest near the optic nerve and the retina is much, much less likely to tear when peeling away from the optic nerve. It's well anchored. If you start peeling in the periphery and towards the macula or towards the optic nerve, you'll get more iatrogenic breaks. So if you can, try and peel from optic nerve out. Sometimes that's where it's an advantage in being left or right-handed uh, or being able to use either hand so you can maintain that preference, my strong preference of going from the nerve out. Uh, why do you prefer green dye instead of blue? You know, I really don't know that I pre prefer it. It's what I kind of grew up with now that I'm old. <laughs> we had green way before blue and I've just always stayed with it. Now I've used blue a little bit here recently in just the last year. And I do like the green because it stains the internal limiting membrane so well, but not ERMs. I find the blue stains epiretinal tissue well, but does not stain the ILM quite as well. And so I think there's going to be a transition here over time. I'm, I'm probably going to be using more blue. I know IC green is going to be tough to get. There's been a supply interruption and, uh, and uh, brilliant blue, not brilliant blue, but uh, whatever the blue trade name is, made by Dork, actually, matter of fact, has now been approved in this country, is available, and we'll be looking at using uh, more of that. Um, what is the ideal starting point of the internal limiting membrane peeling? That's a very good question. So as you saw in the case I did, uh, I liked, that's my standard case. I tend to start a pick peel either above the macula or below, maybe is between the fovea and the arcade or maybe all the way out at the fovea. I like to start in a spot that's stained green. So I know I got the right plane. If it's an ERM over the top and there's no green there, I don't like to start the peel there. I don't know how deep to go. So I look for a green area. Then I know I got the internal limiting membrane. And then I go above or below um, for that type of peeling away from the fovea. Um, I typically will start two points with the little pick above and below, just in case one doesn't peel well with the forcep, I can come back and go to the other spot without having to make another pick point. So start two little points with the pick above and below, then peel one. If it's going well, just keep going on that edge. If I need the restain, a lot of times I just finish with the protractor because I'm already aspirating the green out of the eye and I can just finish the peel into that nice wide mouth of the protractor. What parameters do you use while peeling the ILM with the cutter? You know, it's actually the same parameters um, I have it set for the vitrectomy. So in this case, it's uh, it's aspirating at 350. So it's not any higher than a standard vitrectomy for me. And I do have the pedal floored, so I'm getting all 350. Then it's just a matter of how, it's a matter of how deep you go into the retina with that tip. So you're gonna have to make a little indentation in the retina. You're gonna definitely hit the retinal surface and that can be a little nerve wracking because you are hitting the retinal surface. You're not above the retina to grab that, but you can indent the retina a little bit. It's almost like retinal depression instead of sclerotic depression. You indent with the smooth back corner of the retractor, not the open mouth and point the mouth up a little bit and use it to rub and get that edge up into that cutter mouth and then it keep going. You saw me kind of make during the case like multiple passes to engage and I finally got it and then we went out. How much air do you peel in a case of a macular hole? You know, I just did a macular hole as my, a true macular hole as the second case today. And the way the peel went, we ended up with about one disc diameter around the hole. And I was like, it was done. It was a small macular hole, probably 250 microns across. And I thought to myself, God, I could go back and grab a whole lot more ILM and peel it out from arcade to arcade. And I'm like, but what's the point? The hole's going to close. If the traction is off the edges of the hole, there's no benefit to going way out in a standard macular hole case. Uh, 
I could think of some in high myopes and posterior staphylomas where maybe you're trying to get more retinal relaxation and stretch. But in a standard macular whole eye, really just get the traction off from the center. That can be as little as um, uh, one millimeter radius around the hole. I typically probably do more like two millimeter radius just because that's what I end up with when I start these peels farther out. But in this last case, the the peeling went right to the center and kind of stayed tight. It didn't go farther out, and that was fine. Uh, we'll go through and answer a few more questions um, while we're waiting for them to prep the patient, get them sterilely prepped and draped. They're doing the betadine prep now behind us. You can watch that too if you'd like. Uh, where are we at? So my preferred method of anesthesia, local or general, I prefer local. The patients are very cooperative. Uh, the cases are short. It's much easier for them to go home at the end of the case uh, and pack you if they don't have the effects of general anesthesia. I also do do pediatric retinal surgery. And in those cases, we're all under general. Uh, obviously, for these children, you know, from babies up to 16, perhaps, I prefer general. Um, sometimes you get really claustrophobic patients, psychological issues. I think those patients belong under general. I generally don't have a need for general anesthesia for pain. So if either I'm doing a buckle or just a vit or a buckle vit, I'm good with local myself and we do very well, even during the case and post-operatively. Uh, what are the different vitreous substitutes we use? So besides um, balanced salt solution, uh, which I believe comes from Alcon, I'm pretty sure, uh, the uh, other choices are um, for the gases, air, SF6 gas, uh, 20 or 25%, C3FA gas, typically 15% for me. I'll get about um, a good tamponade from C3FA to about four weeks at that concentration. For SF6, I'll get a good 10 days at 25% for SF6. We use silicone oil. Uh, I prefer 1000 centistroke. It's the thinner oil. It's more easy going in and out. I suspect Eric here may have 5,000 cent of stroke. We'll find out it wasn't my case. So I don't know what's in his eye, depending on how thick it is. We may have to alter our technique to get it out. Uh, and, um, and that's about it. Occasionally, in a rare case, I'll leave perfluoron in the eye. Perfluoron, the heavier than oil substance that tamponades inferior really well, can be nice uh, for really complex retinal detachments with many reops. It, it is tolerated. It's not made on label to be used for long-term retina tamponade or vitreous substitute, but it is tolerated quite often for weeks without any type of inflammation or difficulties. And we go back and take it out. Um, it's like the patient two. Yeah, there you go. So patient two here, 56 year old, blurry vision for six months, no change over six months. His visual acuity is hand motions. He's had a retinal detachment repair times three using vitrectomy techniques. He's currently with silicon oil. This was all done at an outside facility and surgeon referred over for, at this point, uh, re removal of oil and uh, macular surgery work. So not exactly a simple macular pucker, um, but things that are very common out there in the real world. So we'll uh, start the case here. Yeah, Jenny just mentioned she sees an oil bubble in the anterior chamber. Commonly oil will migrate to the anterior chamber. We are going to Take that out for you too and show you how we do that. Uh, so, like I said, this case, a little more going on than the last one. And there's our guy. He is a phakic also. Uh, there's been quite a bit of contraction there on the anterior capsule. It does have a capsule opening in the middle that's left like that purposely by the prior surgeon, I think to facilitate a sulcus PCI well at a later date, which we are not doing today. So one thing in doing a reop case I've learned is try and avoid all old incisions. I'll take a, a forcep. And by that, I mean, we don't wanna hit the old sclerotomy wounds. I like the bonacultas. He's gonna, go. I like, yeah, I don't like tooth forceps because, you know, an eye this red is going to bleed easily. And you can see how the conch doesn't want to move too much, you know, so we're just going to pull it over a little bit, drop. And I know I didn't measure here. That's about three millimeters. How you doing, Eric? Okay. That hurt? 
we're gonna we're gonna make you a little more numb. And so how we're gonna do that, Eric, is we're gonna pull up some more block and some scissors here. I prefer to do a sub tenons injection if possible. Eric, is that pinchy there, Eric? Okay, just hang on one second. We're gonna make a little incision here and get your more anesthesia. So I think this is a nice way to show a little spread action there. And then we got a blunt cannula here, 19 gauge, same solution. And we like to put that right back there. And we'll do one more cut down spot. I like to do two scissors. And is any block left in that syringe? That was pretty miserly. Yeah, like a half CC left. Same technique, we like to cut down. Spread a little bit there. How you feeling now, Eric? Is that pinch there? No. Nope. How about over here? You pinching? Sure, a little something. Okay, how about over here? Uh -oh. Good. So I'm going to put the next cannula in. We're not going to get the cons to move too much in this area. That's kind of a shame. But I don't want to use the old wounds. Um, their wounds are probably high. Yeah, they're high. I agree. So we're going to stay down near the horizontal, even though the conj isn't dislocating for me quite as much. I really don't like to go near old wounds. They spread, they leak, they're problematic. This is, you know, of course, one of the problems in using sutures in prior cases. You can see how the conj just scars down and really gives you some fits if you have to get through it or move it. So I'm almost at the horizontals. There's no trouble or fear about hitting arteries, veins, nerves there. I've never had that be a problem. Um, I know that's where there's some anatomy people are concerned about. And uh, if I ever get a case report or actually see one where someone injured that with sclotomies, I'd be very interested. So we're going to take the oil out first. We have a 25 gauge setup. And we're going to see how this oil is coming out and whether it's going to come out fast enough on oil extraction. Okay. So we're going to see how quick that oil is coming. Oh, it's not bad. I think it's 1,000 just because of the time frame. Yeah, the time frame, yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, no, his last the surgery was a few months ago. But 1,000 was back in stock by then. So we have the oil coming out here. Yeah, it's a little... I wonder if we can speed that up with a... Um, Jenny, by... Um, uh, okay. Oh, popping the cap off, maybe? Popping the cap off and putting the tip over the top? Yeah. yeah. You need this back. We're going to take another way to do this. We're going to, there's another device. Instead of putting the cannula in the eye to pull out the oil, we're going to do it by putting the cannula over the top. We pull off this little cap. You can see the oil dressing there. Quite often, we can get a little... And I'll try and get an idea over here of how quick that's working for us. And I do think that's working quite a bit better. So the advantage being you don't put that metal cannula inside, which is a lumen inside of a lumen. Now we're using the full gauge of the 25 gauge cannula to oil come out. You know, anything that's thinner is going to slow down your egress of oil um, quite a bit. So the bigger the hole, the quicker the oil moves out. And that's what we're going for here. Now we lost our valve. We'll try and, um, <laughs> we'll try and put it back on the case. It is nice to have valves, helps maintain fluid, et cetera. Jenny, we lost the suction. It, we hit air there somewhere. It's probably this little air bubble. I don't know from where, but we have to push this back down. So the the cannula, the oil extraction device just filled. 
with air. So we had a little leak or something. So we're just gonna reset it, push the can, the plunger back down. And start over, no problem. This is just a little bit of patience. Um, And this is oil in here. Yeah, can you get that uh, higher? So it pushes, yeah, the oil on this line. So it got backed up into the infusion. And to push that oil out, we had to raise the eye, the bottle pressure went up to 60 because we want to push that oil in so we can get the eye firm back up. And so we use the irrigation to help us keep the eye firm, encourage the oil evacuation. We could probably almost, you can see the corneal stitch here. I don't think we need that anymore, Jenny. We might as well take that out while we're doing this. And you got like a 0.12 there or something. Well, those are gonna be too big anyhow. I'll never get them around it. Give me a point one two first. And we're just gonna take out the little suture here. We're gonna dry that again. Well, let's see what you got now. Gravitas. Yes. Okay. We'll get a little scissors and then we'll cut that out. So while we're pulling the oil out, we're going to cut this. Now we'll want something to pull that and not the one twos. Give me a bonacalta or something. Oh, not going to work. Give me the one twos or something fine. I know suture tire would be perfect, but there's a point five. Is that better? Nope. Nah, I'm not gonna get that with that. Like a, uh... Give me the point one two and I'll try. If you don't have that, give me the 10 0 tires. Yeah. Tire. I'll get it now. You got the bonacultus. Like to pull it the other way, really, but no, that won't work. It's going to the teeth. Okay. Yeah, we'll just get the tires. I'll get the instrument and we'll pull that suture out. The oil's about up to two or three cc's. The eye's kind of large. So I know we got a ways to go yet. Um, I don't want to take out this bubble to the end because once I start pulling that out, I may just pull more oil to the front. Don't really need that either. There we go. Did 
there we go. Success getting out our suture. It was quite the struggle. <laughs> Hopefully that'll be the hardest part of our case. And the oil continues to come out. You're just not seeing it in here, but it's doing just fine. And our plan on this is to, a couple of things here. Make sure the retina is attached when the oil comes out. There's always a risk of retinal redetachment. Um, published numbers can be as high as 20% when taking out silicon oil. Uh, I don't think his risk is that high. I think you can kind of you can kind of judge that or modify that number when you're looking in the eye before surgery. You know, what kind of scar tissue are you seeing? Where are you seeing it? How do the edges of the retinectomy look? I think he had a rather large inferior retinectomy already. So we'll look at all that when we're doing our membrane peel. The one advantage in peeling the membrane and the macula in this case, it gives a lot of circulation in the eye. And if anything is open or not secured in terms of retinal breaks, we should be able to see the retina redetaching. Uh, you know, while we're still in the eye and not have to wait to find it tomorrow or a week later, which is always very disappointing. If we find it while we're here today, we'll still peel the membrane and the macula, probably end up um, uh, cutting the retina again if it's that severe and reattaching the retina and lasering things and perhaps even using more oil. But I'm hoping the case wouldn't go that way. I'm more optimistic we can just take the oil out peel the membrane leave the eye with balanced salt solution after we check the peripheral retinal well make sure there's no open retinal tears or breaks and we're probably around four cc's now for oil out and again the eye may be a little large so uh, it's going to take us a little time It's always nice to, if we can take oil out this way, instead of cutting down, you can make larger incisions. The next choice would have been to cut the conge down, make a larger opening 20, 20 gauge instance, for instance, and use an 18 gauge angiocath, uh, you know, to put through that scrotomy and pull the oil out more quickly. And then sew the 18 gauge hole shut. Again, I'm, I try to avoid that in multiple reop eyes and you don't know if you're coming back yet again after this, just because any vicral suture and wound you make for a large wound is gonna be a weak point in the sclera for the next case. So if we made a big wound like that and sewed it shut, it may save us a little time today, but then if something happened and we had to come back and not about one more you know, clock hour or half clock hour of the sclerotomy incision areas we can't use. I can't use these up here. I can see the blue areas in the sclera a little bit. Um, that make me very hesitant to want to put any wounds there and have wound leaks post-operatively. So going very well here, just takes time. And so I know it's a live video stream, but we'll get there and you can kind of see what we deal with in these cases too. Well, we don't know. We're gonna find out on the vision. So Eric just asked how much damage is done. And the thing in this type of eye, it's very hard to predict what our final vision will be. I think you're looking at this surgery, Eric, and then letting the eye heal, then ultimately a lens implant. Uh, will be needed yet. But I do like the idea of putting in the sulcus the way they left the anterior capsule there. We're going to open that up a little bit so it's not such a tiny opening to look through for our surgery, but should be able to leave the anterior capsule intact to the point that we can put a sulcus based PCI well in there at a later date. And, um, you know, I would be hopeful with how things, uh, depending how the macula does and how much macular damage there is, that 
with a lens implant, all said and done, that we get you to the middle of the eye chart. Now we can see the oil coming across the eye. There in the back, you can see the meniscus. So we're almost done with this. And you always want to be a little careful towards the end because of this device will pull fluid a lot faster than the infusion can put it in. So you don't want the eye to completely collapse and cause a choroidal hemorrhage. He's a high myope. So certainly that type of risk is higher with Eric than others. And we're just down to the final few drops of the oil. So you hear me kind of back off the pedal a little bit, try and direct the cannula. I'm bending the cannula in a way towards the iris, right? Trying to get the last of the oil without hitting the fluid pockets and really creating a problem. You can see the, the water coming in now a little bit along with oil, both. You see the oil hitting in, the water hitting into the syringe. And there it is, it just got real soft real quick. So I stop immediately, kind of recenter ourselves a little bit. Nope, that's about all we're gonna get. So I'm gonna pull this off. You see the oil, the water freely flowing out. You can see our syringe there. I don't mind letting this run a little bit. Yeah, great. Okay, great. So we got our little valve there and we're gonna just push it back on. Very nice. Well, that was clever. So we got the valve back on. Now let's take the oil out of the anterior chamber. If you can wet the uh, cornea for me. We're gonna get this oil bubble out. Just kind of look which way the eye wants to rotate the most easily. It kind of wants to go this way. So I'm pretty happy to let it do that. I'm just gonna make my incision right here. And you got a force up there to move the eye. Thank you. Not that, the Bonacolta. It's gonna grab the conch here and rotate the eye and then gape this wound open a little bit. And maybe the oil is gonna to wanna to move a different direction. Gonna squirt that again for me. And there we go, we just stab into it and let the oil egress out by gaping the wound a little bit. It tends to wanna to follow itself pretty well. And you can see the oil still coming out there in the last of the bubble. And that's that. Okay, so the oil's out of the anterior chamber. Now we're gonna cut open the anterior capsule a little bit. This eye is certainly more, you know, the tissue is more fibre, the eye is more inflamed. Um, Let's put the cutter on, there you go. And so this is our anterior cap. So we're gonna try and cut into that. And it's very thick, but we'll get it one way or another. You want me to take the cut right down? I thought about that, I don't think so. I think we'll be fine. There we go, now we got an edge. It's just a very fat, fat, they go like capsule, like capsule phimosis, where the capsule contracts. We're just cutting that edge through. The cutter's not the best at this. Let 
you can see it snap open there, right? We just cut both sides, take the traction off. I'm not even that necessarily worried about having to cut the fibrosis off all the way around. We could, we could take more of that out, but I don't know that we have to. We're gonna try and do that, this case without taking all that out. As long as we opened up the aperture, I think we'll get a pretty good view. Hang on a second, something's a little. Yeah, I think it's just an oil droplet, and it is again. She's putting some viscoelastic on the eye for us. Okay. Now we're going to get a look with the wide field first, take a look at the retina, and make sure we're staying attached. and then address the macula. So here's our case. This is actually the best view I've had of this eye too, because the view in the clinic wasn't certainly any better than this. You can see the patients had a large retinectomy, inferior with extensive laser. He's had a 360 retinectomy is what I would tell you. Looks like he had it up here too, and nasally. So the retina is attached. I'm not seeing any detachment. This technically could be a tractional detachment. We're gonna go ahead and stain that. I'll try and zoom in a little bit so you can see what I'm looking at together. Very good. So we're looking at this tissue in particular, this big ridge here, distortion of the macula. How's our video doing? A little. Let's take the IC green dye. Okay, and we're going to put our green in. We know the vitreous is already off. We got a little bit of let the green fly around as we aspirate it out of the eye. So the green here is gonna help us see the ERM, the ILM. We know the ILM is the last layer before the retina, so that's a good dissection plane. Then we're removing all the pathological tissue. Then we're gonna use our pick and reusable forcep for this case. We go to a contact lens here to get a better view. And let's see what we got here. Oh, the capsule may interfere a little too much. And I think it does. Let's take out more of the capsule. Yeah, it, the capsule's obstructing us a little bit here. So we're going to have to do a little work on that capsule piece to get a better view. And it'll just take us a couple minutes, I think. It won't be that bad. Again, in a case like this, whether the capsule is left at all or not is debatable. You, know, you could even just remove it entirely. And what I'm going to do is just cut around the capsule, the fibrotic part that is. And there we go. It doesn't take much capsule support as long as it's in the periphery. You still have a chance of a sulcus IOL. So I'm not too worried about this opening. There we go. So the capsule is still there. You can see it and all the quadrants. 
we'll worry about that later. Like I said, it's not the most critical piece. There's always AC wells or sutured IOLs wells if, if that was truly not gonna hold us. So this here, I've noticed when we put this in the eye, this is a special forcep. We call this the Jenny broken forcep, our pick. Oh. It has a lack of a tip. <laughs> so I named it after. So I named this after my PA here because she doesn't really seem to mind what she hands me during the case. I can't see the tip of that. Yeah, I'm going to show you. I have a scraper. No, 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 it's fine. Actually, we just need something to make an edge. So these, we have several in the sets that I know are broken. And I don't think the surgeon's mind because it's, again, just trying to get a an edge going. And you kind of got one already there, see that? So again, I look for the green. I went to the, in this case, that's the inferior macula, right? Now we're going to switch gears and go to the superior macula. Look for an area of green because I know that's the ILM. You can see that roll coming up there. So I think the uh, like the loop scraper in a case like this will actually be more difficult to use in some ways. Are we there? Are we on the screen? Yes. Because um, it's a little flimsy. Is that better? Or? Uh -huh. And you can see what we're trying to do there. Trying to keep this centered for you guys. And we grab that flap we made by ILM. Sometimes you can get the ILM to come with the ERM. But sometimes you have to peel in two layers in a more severe ERM like this. But once to come all at one time, fine by me. Now I'm peeling towards the nerve there. I will almost stop and go the other direction. But it's nice to go around too, if we can. And we're getting a little out of focus. See if I can't focus that better for you. I'm going to take the uh, protractor. So this is a little awkward to grab going this direction. So let me show you something with the protractor you can do. So we'll take the left hand and peeling with the protractor. One advantage is in the left hand is that you don't have to actuate a forcep. You just use your foot. So it took off that big piece. Here's the ILM behind it. Oh, I'm not as comfortable with that. I'm going to come back to the forcep. And feel a little bit more with this. 
You're doing well. The scar tissue's coming off real nice. A little better focus. I don't think so. We're gonna use the pressure a little bit there for that hemorrhage in the macula, right? This more robust membrane is definitely gonna cause a little more bleeding. You can see PVR membrane. We're off the screen. Oh, we're off the screen. There we go. So anyhow, it just kind of popped on its own there. And so there's your optic nerve. Membranes peeled all through here. What we're probably gonna do at this point, Jenny, is take the ice to green stain a little bit and then see what's left to peel. And see, I'm thrilled with the image. I hope it's better than that. Okay, so just like in the other cases, she's gonna put a little green in there. Hang on, Jenny, you got a oil bubble or a air bubble. There you go. Gently. Gently, gentle Jenny, that's what we call her. And we're gonna take out the green and fragments that we've already peeled and see what we got left that we can do. But we've taken off a significant amount of traction and scar tissue already off this macula and as you can see that piece there and we still got a little bit to go here that i'm going to grab and there that came too the protector is very nice at grabbing more loose membranes too another thing is when you peel the macula what you oftentimes see is the retina turns a little bit white from the trauma of the peel, a little bit of edema all through here, all up here, right? Here you can see the edge of the icy green now real clearly, as well as down here, but that's not our biggest problem. So we're just playing with the pressure a little bit. We went from 35 to 60 back to 35, back up to 60, but all that's going very well. So what we're gonna look at doing now is peeling down here, making sure we're not leaving any tissue, epiretinal tissue. I don't think we are actually, and we'll peel this piece down. And then we'll take a look just a little bit outside the arcades being in our D case, make sure we got everything. The patient did have a prior macular hole during one of his retinal detachments um, that was closed under the oil, but closed and scarred her. Different things too. So here we go. We're gonna, I know we're probably off the screen at times, I apologize, more complex case. ILM in the tech case like this is a little more difficult to peel, tends to be more sticky. 
doesn't like to separate quite as well. It comes off more piecemeal typically. So we're in pretty good shape. Homogeneous staining like this, you know, nice even stain kind of shows you there's no residual ERM out there. There's probably a little bit down here, but we're pretty remote from the macula and we see no traction. So I'm not worried out here. I'm not worried over here because there's no non-staining area. And we'll take a look maybe a little closer at that hemorrhage site. You can see how the retina was folded here from the ERM. So we'll let that unfold naturally. We'll take a look at the hemorrhage, make sure we don't have a break there. Or if we do, we'll leave, certainly want to be leaving gas. And maybe we'll leave gas anyhow to help smooth things out. You got a soft tip? Let's try and pop that little macular hemorrhage or see if we can lift that macular hemorrhage up, see what's under there. Now, this is very gentle aspiration. Oh, thank you. Yep, keep, yeah, let me know every time. So there's no hole down here. It's just a hemorrhage spot where the ERM was very thick. It was its epicenter, more or less, right? It was very adherent. I still don't like this case in terms of not tamponating because there's a prior macular hole in this case. So we are going to um, leave SF6, okay, which is immediate acting medium term gas. Now we're going to take a look also at the periphery a little bit. So I'm going to put the SF6 in to help smooth the macula. I know there's a prior macular hole. I know he's a high myope. I know the macula is extremely thin, and I'm just very hesitant to let that heal up without a tamponade. So let's take a look here in the peripheral retina. Make sure we're nicely attached before we put the gas in. Don't touch. Don't touch. We'll try and, oh, pretty good focus. So you can see the peel, almost the entire macula was peeled in this case. Took a lot of scar tissue away from this epicenter proliferation right here, which we're gonna leave alone. All this white, the peripheral retina is still nicely attached. So we're, you know, the prior surgeon did a nice job keeping this retina on for us to get to this point. And uh, that's where we're at. A little spell depression. You saw me run it over there and I'll run it over here too. I am really not seeing anything up in the periphery. We certainly see some opacified vitreous here from the PBR where it hasn't been completely trimmed out. Take a quick. Yeah, a little pressure there. Not it's seeing great. any cyclic membranes. Its pressure was okay preoperatively. So I remain optimistic there. So we're going to put the air in and we're set. Air, then gas. Okay. And we'll grab the rest of these little fragments. 20, yeah, 25. Okay. You're doing well, Eric. The, uh, Scar tissue came out real nicely. The retina is remaining attached. I like how the um, scar tissue came off the macula, filled out very well, and uh, relieved all the traction. Now it's a matter of seeing what we can recover for vision. I know that hand motion is where we started. She's gonna focus this for us a little better. As we go to the air, there's often a change in focus and some glare, sorry for that, everyone. We'll try and get you the best views we can. So that's about it. So now we're gonna go through the uh, wounds again. You can see the air bubble in the anterior chamber. It doesn't bother me at all. Right. Aphic a guy, he'll be fine with a little face down positioning if there's any pressure issue. Now let's close this one up. I'm sure it's, you got a point one two there. Right. So we're gonna press down on this guy. This eye, just friable tissue everywhere, very inflamed, multiple surgeries. Let's go ahead and put the gas bubble through the SF6. 
I'm venting in the sclerotomy here by putting the 0.12 forceps in and just letting them kind of passively open. 40. Okay, and we'll pull that one out. And I'll need the, some resistance from you. Keep going. Keep going. She's pushing flu air in or gas in while I'm pressing down on this hole. There you go. You can come off. Okay, that ease up. There we go. So I made my little black mark over the roof of my tunnel there. I'm not sure this one's going to hold because, again, very thin eye, very thin, I mean, very thin sclera, high myope. And this was in a tough spot. We manipulated this wound quite a bit too. The more manipulations you do. Go ahead and pump that up again for me. Okay, stop right there. Not oh, that's holding. Let's see what we get here now. Okay, a little bit more. Oh, got a Q-tip there. And we do have a leak at this site. Go ahead. Little Q-tip can plug it while we check this one and see how many holes we're going to have here that are a problem. So it's only this one. So I'm going to hold a Q-tip here for a minute. A lot of times if you just wait, these wounds will swell up and close. But if that's not the case here, like the other two are closed and not leaking at all, if this one continues to leak, no hesitation to throw a 7 bicral suture through this to close it. And it's doing great. Eyes very firm, actually. Probably a little too firm. <laughs> yeah. Because I was going to grab. Well, we're going to have to. Yeah, probably going to have to pull a little gas out or a little firm. So we did get it to close. We're just going to take a little bit of um, gas out. So um, and we're going to just soften the eye a little bit. And we won't have to be in here long. We just come down here. And that's it. That's all it took. Eric, we're getting you out. We got a gas bubble in the eye. I'm going to ask you to hold your head down for two days. That's all. Just like a macular hole case. Got it. It helps the macula smooth out. So I know you're not going to see until the gas goes away, which is going to take about two weeks in your larger eye. And that's when the vision will return. And we're just going to have you hold your head down for two days. And after that, you can uh, just sleep face down. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, answer a few questions here. You know, five, 10 minutes. Um, so the role of ILM peeling in this patient with ERM and no macular hole, I think it helps us get the right plane, not to leave any epiretinal tissue behind. Again, if the whole thing stains completely green, uh, there's probably really no benefit. But if you got like patchy green, then you know you got some ERM in there. And so I think you just take the ILM to make it clean all the way around. Yeah. And uh, what advice would you give to new vitreo retinal uh, fellows who want to learn macular hole surgery? I would advise to apply to our fellowship here at Retina Associates of Cleveland and Cleveland Eye and Laser. We run a great fellowship and uh, Dr. Shuley will be our first fellow participant this July. We have um, a team of 10 surgeons. Uh, you know, I'd let any of these guys operate on my own eye. They're fantastic. You know, a combined 300 years experience. You generally want to get with a mentor. Seriously, when to get to a mentor, anyone you can, the work side by side for a few dozen cases and not just watch, but actually get a chance to put the instruments in your hand and have them suggest things to you. I, that's, I think that is the best way to go about it. Otherwise, if you don't have that, opportunity to train with someone, just go ahead and um, uh, I would say take yourself to a, um, a location, a spot where you're working on the simplest cases with the highest return for the risk. So like a macular hole, that's 2200. Uh, start with those types of cases. I would not do the 2030 case like my first case. I would try to go for people starting out with worse vision with lots of upside and be very gentle and um, cautious in your approach. Uh, you know, in terms of if you can peel the posterior hyaloid and everything stains green, maybe let that case go. 
if you pull the posterior hyaluronic in the macular hole and there's not staining green around the macular hole because of an epiretinal membrane, maybe get more aggressive there. So kind of work your way up. To clarify the second question, I wanted to know if there's any particular techniques to separate the posterior hyaloid in case of breakthrough hemorrhage like port peri, oh, I, I see, polypoidal coronavascular, uh, you know, vascularization or polypoidal disease, um, very adherent in those areas and iatrogenic breaks. For those types of cases, um, I find, so it, kids are the most adherent ones I deal with, uh, you know, the cutter under aspiration, the cutter down in the optic cup, and using the edge of the cutter to grasp the edge of the Weiss ring. You're trying to get the Weiss ring up, that little ring, that pocket of fibrous tissue around the optic nerve. If I can't get it on the cutter, uh, I'll try the pick. They go down there to the point where I'm, I'm making retinal hemorrhages even. So I'm down with that pick so deep in the optic cup that I can make little splinter hemorrhages in the nerve fiber layer. And ultimately, if that doesn't work, the flex loop is very nice. You can use the flex loop, extend it just partially the partially out and use just that as a wider surface area with that little loop to get under that Weiss ring and elevate up. Those are my three best techniques. If you can't get it there, um, I agree, it can be very problematic. It is certainly challenging for all of us. And uh, any consequences from iatrogenic hemorrhages caused by instruments near the macula? Really none. If you get a hemorrhage on the macular surface, it's almost always gone the next day. Hemorrhages in the deeper layers at the RPE or deep retina uh, may make an RPE defect or atrophy. That's why you want to be away from the fovea. Ideally, all your hemorrhaging should be away from the fovea. This last case had a hemorrhage near the fovea. It could not be helped. The tissue was extremely adherent, very dense PVR over the macula there. But then you saw the fold in the macula. So if you don't get the fold out, we're kind of stuck anyhow. So just have to be more aggressive sometimes. Any antibiotics? I did not use any antibiotics in either case. Um, uh, cataract surgery uses some intracameral antibiotics, retinal surgery is still not. Um, how many milliliters of uh, silicon oil did I aspirate? That was a high myope, and he had about seven to eight cc's of oil in the eye, uh, which is a lot. That comes about 10 per vial, so they almost used all of it. How can the silicon oil be completely removed? The best way is the way I did it. Uh, and when you're doing, after the oil's out, uh, this patient's aphakic, so you don't have that problem of stuff being trapped up near the lens, that's easier. I'll use sequential air fluid exchanges in a phakic eye. So we go up and down with the water level in the eye and the oil collects on the surface. You can keep aspirating the surface as you go down. Then you fill the eye back up with fluid. It's oil's moving around again, go to air again and suck the, fluid out, but always sucking it right from the surface. So you're grabbing the oil slick on top of the water, using the advantage of the fact that oil floats on water, but sinks under air and it's right at the interface. Will oil evacuation affect pupil opening? Do you use intraocular adrenaline to maintain dilation? I do not use intraocular adrenaline. Um, if I have a problem with pupil size, I'll use iris hooks. I go right to a mechanical. Any particular reason why silicon oil took this long? Yeah. This, there's a lot of oil and it's a 25 gauge aspiration, but that allowed us to avoid sutures postoperatively, as you saw. It would have been very disappointing to do all that and then end up having the suture at close. That would have been, you know, not what I wanted, but it worked out. Is there any difference in removing oils that are indifferent? Yeah, there is a big difference. Um, if you're using 1,000 weight oil, it goes in and out pretty easily. The 5,000 weight oil, uh, has a problem that it's so thick it won't come out through 25 gauge or even 23 gauge easily. You have to cut the eye open and just use an 18 gauge angiocath, in my opinion, and pull it out that way or you'll be there for a terribly long time. Um, why not remove the capsule and perform silicon foil uh, a suture fixated IOL later? You could. You could definitely remove the capsule. No doubt if I was doing the, the RD repairs in this gentleman, I probably would have taken that capsule out for fear of further proliferation, cyclic membranes, hypotony. I think if you're going to leave a capsule in and an RD reop, you better be pretty confident you got the PVR piece covered. Uh, so if that was my initial surgery, correct, I would have taken it all out. At this point, it's fine. We'll leave it there. I think scleral fixated is still inferior to sulcus placement of an IOL. 
it's faster, there's no external fixation, there's nothing subconscious for later possible infections. Is it the laser marks or retinotomy scar? The white band down below was heavy fibrosis from uh, PVR and laser scarring. Any particular choice of the type of gas? You know, it, not really. You have to pick and choose here. He didn't have a macular hole, but he had one in the past. He didn't have one in this case. The macula was folded up. I'm concerned the hole could reopen. I used a short acting gas as opposed to nothing. The other choice here would have been BSS. Are all ERM and ILM surgically peelable? Actually, I think they are. Uh, there's a rare, rare patient where the epiretinal tissue um, from fibrovascularization, from, fib from neovascular disease, may be integrated into the retina. A really bad diabetic with fulvial neovascularization, for instance, is probably one case where you may not be able to remove the tissue directly from the fovea because it's integrated into the fovea and you're going to make a macular hole or a macular defect. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. Uh, the time being with you again. I always enjoy my time here in CyberSite. I get this great hat. And if you see me out at the conferences, uh, please come up and say hi. Happy to talk to anyone. Thank you.